right? You've made the charge, whatever it is, and then they, they, the IRS representatives come in and represent you. Well, here's an interesting thing which I've never tested, but you got to remember the definition of a court. It's, a su it's the person and suit of the sovereign. If you open up IRS court and you are the sovereign of the court and this is your suit and then you label it a court of record, automatically it goes into common law, doesn't it? And if they don't object to that, it sticks. Okay? What's interesting is that in all the cases where we say, I'm one of the people and in this court of record complain of, you know, in all those instances, never has any of the opposition ever objected to that or challenged it. They just read right over it. They don't understand the significance of that. And once they've accepted it, it's there. Because in the following paperwork, and in every paperwork, I always say the same thing, one way or another. I don't say it directly, I say it indirectly. I say, I am so-and-so, uh, one of the people of whatever jurisdiction you're in, whether it's the state jurisdiction or the federal jurisdiction. And in this court of record, respond to, object to, whatever, okay? And they never, they never challenge that. So that means they accept the definitions, right? We have a lawsuit going right now where we actually laid it out. We put all the definitions. What's a court of record? It's proceeding according to common law. We, we even put the cases that, case law that, that supports that. Every single attorney came back quoting code. There's no code in the common law. This is a court of record. There's no code in the court of record. And you see, as a sovereign, when you set up your court, what you do is you, you, de you decree what the law is in this case. The law of the case. You all know that if you appeal a case and you, f and you failed to, to object to something or you failed to, to bring in whatever laws, codes, and so forth, the Court of Appeals isn't going to fill in the blanks for you. Right? They go on whatever you present. So, as a sovereign, you can decree what the law of the case is. Okay? Let me show you uh, in our example. Um, let's go to the example here. Right there. Okay? In this example, if we go down to the, uh, let's see, First Amendment action. First Amendment action exists because the original action wasn't any good. We tossed it out and replaced it with this one. Okay? But notice what it says. Paragraph 2, which normally, paragraph 2 would normally be paragraph 1 in a normal lawsuit or in a counterclaim. But this was the first amended action, so the first paragraph is de devoted to explaining what the amendment was. Namely that uh, uh, the, the first amended action amends by entire substitution the action filed October 7th, 1998 in the above settled, uh, uh, entitled court. There. There, how's that? Can everybody read it? Okay, so then we go down to paragraph two. There we go, you see the whole thing. Okay, so paragraph two, which normally is the first paragraph, says, William Jones, here and after plaintiff, is one of the people of California and in this court of record complains of and names the defendants. That's it. Okay, that establishes the forum, that establishes your sovereignty. And we'll get into that when we get into <coughs> deep into sovereignty as to why the people are sovereign. And we go down here to, further down, here's the, the cause of actions, what was done. And now we have the law of the case. And the sovereign says, remember, if you're sovereign, you, you say what the law is. And I'll show you the case law that supports that. But 
take my word for it for the moment. The law of this case is further decreed. Okay, now the reason it's further decreed is because there had been some prior paperwork where the sovereign decreed the law. But here's where he decreed more laws in order to cover some problems that were popping up in the process. He says, if any claim, statement, fact, or portion in this action is held inapplicable or not valid, such decision does not affect the validity of any other portion of this action. That's now the law because the sovereign so decreed it. The masculine gender includes the feminine and neuter. Okay? The present tense includes the past and future tenses, and the future the present, and the past the present. Now, this is, this is wording that you see all the time in the uh, codes. Right? This is where I got the wording from. So, um, but what I'm pointing out is that in the actual um, complaint or action, we are putting in what the law of this case is. And so it goes. Simplex dictum, that basically means uh, just uh, the, we're just talking. Aren't you, aren't you, you had the California Vehicle Code. Aren't you mixing codes with common law? No. No. Good point. Excellent point. Let's go back here. California Vehicle Yeah, I will. I will. Okay. The question is, we're using California Code here. Aren't, I mean, aren't we using it? Aren't we using code? We thought this was a common law court. Well, we are proceeding according to the common law. We're just proceeding. That's what a court of record does. It proceeds according to the common law. But the purpose of the court is to right the wrongs. Okay? Now, this whole case is comes from the sovereign. The sovereign is the plaintiff. He's suing. The definition of a court is a person and suit of the sovereign. So, what what the sovereign did was decree that this is the law. So the authority comes from the sovereign, the words come from the vehicle code. That's why we're using, it appears we're using the code. It certainly fools the attorneys. So the attorneys might quote another contradictory code somehow, but it doesn't mean anything in this court because he's not authorized to uh, decree what the law is. Only the sovereign decrees the law. The defendant does not decree the law either. Okay? So, that's an example in a, in a lawsuit where we decree what the law is. Okay? Okay, back to this. All right, let's get into the logical chain of, uh, uh, of points. Uh, Bill, one more yes. question. Uh -huh. If we choose to use the habeas corpus, do you have uh, an example of that? How would, how Not would today, no, okay. but, but the principles are all there because there's, there's in, in terms of form, basically... In practical terms, the only difference between a habeas corpus and a counterclaim and a regular claim, the only difference is you're not asking for damages. You're not claiming an injury. That's very important. Do not claim an injury in a habeas corpus. All court proceedings basically amount to a search for the injured party. That's basically what every court proceeding is. We're looking, somebody's making a claim, but we have to say, well, who is injured? Okay. In a habeas corpus proceeding, you're not claiming an injury. What you're doing is you're looking for the injured party, the corpus delicti. Okay. That's what you're looking for. If you say you are the injured party in a habeas corpus, you have now granted them jurisdiction. So you do not admit to any injury. You may be standing in front of the judge with a pool of blood around you, okay? And you are not injured. You are merely undergoing a reasonable inquisition in the search for the injured party. 
However, if they fail to locate the injured party, you then may become, may become the injured party because it was obviously an unjustified search and the techniques used were unjustified. But you're never the injured party in a habeas corpus. Injured, you know, habeas corpus has been used a number of different ways. Uh, it hasn't always been used the way we think of it being used. For example, um, habeas corpus has been used to go out and pick up somebody. We're looking for the injured party. Produce the body, right? Well, he's not in jail. He's out on the street. Go get him. So habeas corpus uh, was for, I think it was about a hundred years, it was used in that manner. It rose up to popularity among the prosecutors and sheriffs and then it lost popularity because it was abused, of course. But that's, it was used that way. So habeas corpus can be a dangerous thing too. But uh, basically, don't talk about your injuries, don't talk about whatever's done to you, what you talk about is their lack of jurisdiction and where's the authority. And don't give them any hints either. Don't tell them they didn't produce a, an injured party. Let them figure out they have to produce it. Later on you can make a ruling saying that it, that it, uh, they didn't produce the injured party. Yes? Where would you file the habeas corpus? Habeas corpus? That, uh, interesting thing about a habeas corpus is that you can file it anywhere in any court. And you can file multiple habeas corpuses. Uh, we did one for, you may know Al Thompson. Okay? He, a habeas corpus was filed in the, as I understand it, in the United States District Court, which was the court that was chastening. It was filed in the Appellate Court. It was filed in the Supreme Court. It was filed in the State Superior Court, the State Appellate Court, and the State Supreme Court. There were six of them filed. I think it cost something like 50, 60 bucks for postage. And uh, hang on a second. So then um, um, that got them some results. That, that, that uh, shook the system. But anyway, yeah, okay, you had another question if you're right with me. Yeah, uh, during Lincoln's time in the Civil War, I understand he didn't allow habeas corpus. Well, look, uh, war, when, once Congress gives authority to the president to conduct a war, then he has the discretion to conduct it any way he wants. He may have to answer later for what he did. So everybody, from what I, the legal literature that I've read, everybody agreed that what Lincoln did was illegal when he withheld habeas corpus from everybody. But he did do it. I mean, that's power. Well, I mean, you know, when they, when, when uh, somebody, when the robber has a gun in your face and says, give me your money, what do you do? Give him the money. That's right. So you see, you can't, you know, Lincoln had the, the physical power, so who's to stop him? They're all telling him it's wrong, but he did it anyway. And that isn't the first time, because who was it, um, I think it was Jefferson, and maybe it was also Lincoln, so one of those two, I think, actually arrested a congressman because the congressman was politically opposed to him. Okay? Wrong? Illegal? Yeah, but who stopped him? Yes? Now, are all the habeas, are they the same? Are you waiting for one gets rejected and then five? No, they're all hit at the same time. Yeah. Okay? Now, in the Supreme Court, when you do a habeas corpus in the Supreme Court, they want to know why didn't you go to the uh, appellate court first, a lower court. So they want that explanation. But other than that, they're the same. Yes, you had a question over here. Somebody did. Okay. All right. So shall we get into sovereignty then? Now, is everybody satisfied? Last, last call for what to say in court. Okay. Then we'll get into uh, the sovereignty.